I'll be reading from 2 Chronicles 32, verse 33. 2 Chronicles 32, verse 33. And Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the chiefest of the speculars of the sons of David, and all Judea and the inhabitants of Jerusalem did him honor at his death, and Manasseh his son reigned in his stead. Good morning. Everybody turn to Second Chronicles. You're probably already there for reading along with Robert, but go ahead and turn to Second Chronicles. And we're actually going to be looking at chapter 33. Second Chronicles, turn to chapter 33. Before we begin our lesson this morning, we've got some great news. Uh, Wayne and Lisa McCollum along with Whitley and McCollum, wants to place their membership right here at the Liberty Church of Christ. They've been coming to this congregation now, many of you know, for several uh, weeks now. So, uh, if y'all can stand up back there in the back, just kind of stand up, let everybody say hi to you. Hello, there's Lisa. Is, is Whitley there? Where's, where's she at? There she is. Uh, okay, there, these are the two. You want to be sure to hug their necks and welcome them. Thank you. You can be seated now. So be sure to come and find them out and, and, and say welcome. Now, Wayne's not here. Wayne works uh, on the week. He's a truck driver and he's gone on the road, but he's here every Wednesday night but he worships uh, on the road. So uh, we want to remember those folks. They want to put their time and their talent and their resources to work right here at this congregation. So you want to welcome them. And, of course, the elders will be in touch with you guys, find out what your talents are and what you can do to be involved. Uh, they also have Colton and Cooper. They're, right, they're down there somewhere, aren't they? Uh, you just just raise your hand. There's, there's Gary go right there. <laughs> So be sure to come and say hello to them, and, and we, we're so happy that they're part of the congregation. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how that, you know, these are members of the church, and uh, the Bible tells us what to do to be saved, and so we baptize folks into Christ for the remission of their sins. God adds them to the church, so we do that. God tells us what to do when you come forward because you maybe fell away from Christ, uh, Christianity, you fell away from God and you want to get back right, so we pray for one another and confess our faults. We know what to do there. Uh, we pray for each other during hard times, but the Bible doesn't really tell us what to do when a faithful Christian comes and wants to just place a membership with a local congregation. So there's a good way to do it, and that is to recognize that they're here and to go to God in prayer, ask God to bless their ministry. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be together to worship you this day. We thank you that this congregation exists. We exist in this community for the good of not only each other and our families, but also the community, the county, the state, and worldwide. We've got things going on that's helping your kingdom to grow. We pray, Father, that you will be with this family that has decided to come and be a, a part of this work here and this worship time. Father, we pray that you will bless their time, their talents, their treasure, and help them to put them to use in wise ways to follow the leadership of our elders who set the tone and set the uh, guidance for what we need to be doing to honor you in whatever capacity. We pray that you will be with their children and help them to uh, learn under the tutor tutelage of the teachers here and grow to be fine uh, uh, Christians and fine folks to follow your will. Father, we pray that you'll be with us the rest of this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And by the way, don't forget, as was announced by Mike, the World Bible School representative is scheduled to be here at 5 o'clock. So those of you that signed up for that, you're interested in knowing a little bit more about it, not only can we help locally, we can help out there and not even leave our homes. So uh, that's an opportunity. So if you signed up for that, then certainly be here at 5 because we, we want uh, him to have us to talk to. But if you didn't sign up and you said, well, I'm kind of interested in that World Bible School effort, then, uh, and you just want to know, it's not like you signed up to do it. Uh, this is a sign-up sheet to find out more about it. So even if you didn't sign the sheet, you be here at 5 o'clock. That's just an hour before worship. And for about half an hour or so, he will share with us what that's all about and how we can be study helpers and how we can help uh, spread the gospel locally and abroad. Manasseh. 
2 Chronicles chapter number 33 that was just uh, that we're going to be looking at today. So have your Bibles there. Who in the world is Manasseh and what can we learn from Mr. Manasseh? Well, you recall that the first king of all of Israel was Saul. And after he was put out, King David came in and served as king over the united country. And then after David, his son Solomon came in. And he was really got this kingdom strong. And everybody from all over, the, just, whoa, Solomon is great. And even the queen of Sheba came to check him out uh, and see how rich he was and how well he'd done his, his and the half has not been told. That, and that was a very solid kingdom. For 40 years that Solomon ruled, that there was peace in the land. It was great. But after Solomon, his son Rehoboam, uh, came into power and split the country wide open. Uh, Jeroboam became the king of the north, and Rehoboam retained the kingship of the south. The north was called Israel, the south is called Judah, and they had a civil war and they split up. And so they remained their independent authority and sovereignty. Well, over the course of time, there was several kings of the north, and there were several kings of the south. The northern kings were all bad. No good kings up there. And the southern kings had some good and bad. We're now going to focus our attention to these southern kings. Throughout the course of the kingship of the southern kings, there were several kings that came in and went out, came in and went out. And Hezekiah, which was mentioned just now in our reading by Robert, in chapter 32 of 2 Chronicles, verse 33. I'll look at that again. Hezekiah slept with his fathers. That means he died. Hezekiah was a pretty good king. He did some great things. He made some mistakes. He, he allowed some things to happen that God wasn't happy with. And there was a prophet always right there beside Hezekiah that came in and said, God is happy with you when you do this. God is upset with you when you do that. And that prophet's name was Isaiah. We have his book in our Old Testament. Isaiah was right there with Hezekiah, preaching to him, counseling him, helping him. Right there toward the end of his life, he thought he got sick, and Isaiah went and told him, you're going to die. This sickness is going to lead to your death. And he had no kids. Hezekiah had no kids, so he couldn't have an heir. But yet God had promised that the sepulcher or the kingship would not depart from David, so David's rain would be, but how could he pass anything on? But so be it. You're still going to die with no heirs. And uh, he was upset about that. He turned his face on his deathbed to the wall and he prayed to God, God, give me life. Don't let this disease lead me to death. And before Isaiah could get out of the courtyard, he was called upon by God and God said, I heard Hezekiah's prayer. And so Isaiah turned around went back in, and he said, you tell Hezekiah that I'm going to give him some more years. I think it was, what, 15 more years? During that time, he had a boy, and that boy's name was Manasseh. And now he's got an heir that can take the throne. But Hezekiah died eventually after that length of time. He slept with his fathers. They buried him in the very chief places among the sons of David because he was a son of David, a, a, a descendant of David. And all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem honored him at his death. He was a pretty good king, and they all miss him. But Manasseh, his son, took his place, reigned in his stead. So we're going to be looking at this king that is Manasseh of Judah, that's the son of Hezekiah. And we're going to find out if his daddy, who's Hezekiah, who's so good, did it make a difference in his life and how he presented himself to God and how he responded to that power that he had been given to be the king of Judah. Well, we're going to find out right off that Manasseh was corrupt. He was not like his daddy at, in the least. He was awful. Now, in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, Beginning at verse number 1, and we're going to look at this whole chapter, so stay with us in that text. Keep your Bibles out. 
Manasseh was only 12 years old when he began to reign. So he was born in that last few years of Hezekiah's life. And he reigned for 55 years in Jerusalem, who was the capital city of Judah down there. But he is awful. Look at verse number 2. He did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. He didn't do good at all. Like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. When God led them out of Egypt and brought them over into the land of Canaan, the people who were the Canaanites, the Amorites, and the bad folks, they were heathens. He said Manasseh was just as bad as those guys. He was awful. He was corrupt against him, his own self. That's the way he behaved himself. But he was not corrupt only against his own self. He was corrupt against God. Look at verse number 3. For he built the high places, which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. Now those high places, there was a temple in Jerusalem built by Solomon, and everybody would go to Solomon's temple and worship God. But out there in the country place, people would want to worship God false gods, not the God of heaven. And so they would find themselves a high place. Now a high place is just a rise in the ground. If you're walking down and there's a little hill, that's a little bit higher. So a little bit higher means you're closer to some God. And so what they would do is go to this little high place and they would build an altar. And then they would worship to whatever God they choose. Hezekiah, Manasseh's daddy, hated that. You can't worship all these false gods out there on these little hills all throughout the land. So he sent out to destroy those high places. You just knock them down. When well, Manasseh comes along and says, build them back. I don't respect God. I'm corrupt in my life against God. So you go ahead and you build all the high places you want. Rebuild the ones that Hezekiah knocked down. In fact, he reared up altars. For Balaam, that's a false god. He made groves, that's another area of idol worship. He worshipped all the host of heavens. The host of heavens is the stars. When you look up, you say, hey, there's a constellation. There's Orion's Belt, there's the Big Dipper, there's the Little Dipper, all these constellations. So he began to worship the stars. He worshipped the host of heavens. And what did he do? He served them. He didn't serve the Creator, God. He served the creation. And he began to worship all of that. Maybe the sun and the moon and the stars and so forth. He was corrupt in his worship to God. Also, verse number 4, he built altars in the house of the Lord. Think about that. This is the house of God that Solomon built, the temple of God. Instead of worshiping the one true God, he brought in altars to false gods in the house of the Lord. That is corrupt beyond measure against God. Wherefore the Lord has said in Jerusalem, shall my name be forever. God said, in Jerusalem, in this temple, my name is going to be here forever. People are going to worship me. But Manasseh could care less. I don't care what you say, God, about worshiping you in the Jerusalem. No, I'm going to bring in false worship in Jerusalem because I don't care about you. In verse number 5, he built altars for the host of heaven, all those stars, in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He had no respect for God at all. False worship going on right in God's house. Verse number 6, he caused his children, listen, to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. The valley of Hinnom is right outside of Jerusalem. One of those valleys, out the, the, Jerusalem sits on a hill, there's valleys around it. One of those is the valley of Hinnom. And in the valley of Hinnom, uh, years before Manasseh, during the days of uh, the Amorites and the Canaanites and all of that, they worship Moloch and Baal and all these. Well, the way they worshipped them is sacrifice their children. Moloch, they had a big iron statue, and it was hollow. And Moloch, the false god, was made out of iron, and he had his hands sticking out. And behind him was a hollowed-out place that the priest 
of that false god would make a fire and make it real hot. As a result, the whole iron uh, idol became scorching hot. And to worship him, they would take their little children and they'd walk up to his hands, uh, this idol, and just plop those kids alive right there on the hands of those and just sacrifice them right there. That is degenerate. That is pitiful. And who would ever do that to their child? Manasseh did. In verse number 6, he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of Hinnom. Also, not only did he sacrifice his own kids, he observed times, enchantments, he used witchcraft. And we saw last week that there's uh, pharmakeia, that's the the Hebrew word, not pharmakeia, that's the uh, Greek word, but the same Hebrew word is for pharmacy and drug abuse. So he got off into all of that and sorceries. He dealt with a familiar spirit. That's mediums. Hey, I want to talk to the other side. So he got a medium to, to reach out to the beyond in sorcery and, and all of that stuff. Because he doesn't care about God. He's just reaching out to false worship. Wizards. In fact, he brought much evil in the sight of the Lord. And he provoked him to anger. He made God mad. Folks, when you can provoke God who loves you, loves you, and while we were yet sinners, He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus. That's how much He loves you. But Manasseh was so corrupt, he made God mad. Now, verse number 7, he carved an image, the idol which he made, in the house of God, again, of which God has said to David and Solomon his son, in this house... In Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Again, he repeated that. This is my place. This is my house. Don't you come to my house and worship your false god. And Manasseh said, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do it. Neither, verse number 8, I will any more remove the foot of Israel out of the land which I have appointed him. God said, I promised you that I would give you this land. I promised you. Because I love you so much that I would make sure it's appointed to your father so that they could take heed to do all that I've commanded them. If you will do what I tell you to do, then you can live in this country for forever. But they didn't. And Manasseh didn't. Do the whole law of God. Keep his statutes, the ordinance by the hand of Moses. Do the law of Moses and I'll be there for you. Manasseh said, forget it. I'm not going to listen to God's Bible, the law of Moses at the time. I'm not going to listen to what God has to say. I'm not going to listen to his prophets. I'm not going to listen to Isaiah because Isaiah is still there. He's preached to his daddy, and no doubt he comes to Mr. Manasseh, Hezekiah's son, and said, you need to be more like your daddy. You need to be following the law of God. Let me teach you this. But he didn't. In fact, he was corrupt against others. Manasseh, verse number 9, made Judah, the inhabitants of Israel, or Jerusalem, to err. He caused problems for other folks. Not only was he a corrupt person, not only did he bring corruption against God, he caused other people to worship God falsely, or worship false gods, to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. So he's causing other. You know, it's one thing. For you to do your meanness. You to do your own bad stuff. That's one thing. But when you go out and encourage other people to get in on it, that's a whole different ballpark. You're causing corruption to them too. And that's exactly what he did. The Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. God spake to them. Manasseh. God spake to the people. But they wouldn't listen. This is not in the Bible, young people. This is a tradition. Uh, But tradition says that Manasseh had Isaiah sawed in half. Isaiah, how did he die? The Bible doesn't tell us how he died. We know he died. How did he die? Tradition says that it was Manasseh that killed him. Can you imagine Isaiah coming to Manasseh and talking to him like he did his daddy? His daddy repented. When Isaiah said, God told you this and you're not doing it, you need to straighten up. Hezekiah said, sure. But when Isaiah came to Manasseh and said, you doing wrong, you need to fix this. Manasseh had him killed. But 
A man like that, can he ever change? Is it possible for someone so corrupt, so religiously deprived, sacrificing children, doing witchcraft, doing drugs, doing all sorts of, even causing other people to err against God. Can somebody so corrupt make a change? And the answer is yes. Let's look at verse 11 of chapter 32, 33. Wherefore, the Lord brought upon them captains of the host of the king of Assyria and took Manasseh among the thorns, bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. God said, you're making me mad. I'm upset with your corruption, of what you're doing. He sent the Assyrians, an enemy, and grabbed Manasseh, the king of Judah, and put fetters on him. This is binds, but one of the traditional ways they did that was to put a hook in their slave's nose. And there's chains coming off of that. So they would grab those chains, and when they pull them, that's where you go. You, you're not going to stop. You're not going to say, well, I'm going to pull against that chain. No. If there's a hook in your nose, you're going that direction. And that's how they did it. They stripped him down with no clothing, and they pulled him away into Babylon. Horrible place to go. God said, I rebuke you. I'm going to put you on your knees. I'm going to send some stuff into your life that's going to hurt because I love you. Of course, you still love me, and I see he loves the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever will, you know, can be saved. If you love somebody that much, then you're going to still love them even though they're doing this corruption. So I love you so much, but it's going to cost you. I'm going to rebuke you. And he did by allowing him to be carried away into great affliction and sorrow and hurt. So look at verse number 12. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. That means he prayed. He prayed and he prayed and he prayed. What did he do? He humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Manasseh repented. Before the God of his fathers, that's Jehovah, not Baal, not Balaam, not Molech, no. When he humbled himself, he got down to God. And he said, I humble myself to the true God of heaven, not the stars and the host of the consolation. No, God. And, verse number 13, he prayed unto him. And because of his prayer and his repentance, he was entreated of him. That means God listened. Some people think that they get so far out and they're so far corrupt and they're in such pain and iniquity and affliction that God just won't listen. There's no point in praying. There's no point in studying the Bible. There's no point in trying to get closer to God because he won't listen. Yes, he will. If he will listen to Manasseh, he will listen to David. And so when he prayed, God listened. He was entreated of him. That means God heard him. He heard his supplication. So what did he do? He brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. He put him back on the throne of Judah. Even though he's in that bad place, he put him back on his job. He said, I'm going to give you a second chance. Then Manasseh, having a second chance, knew that the Lord, he was God. Not Orion, not Baal, not all, no. I now know because of this experience and because God heard my prayer, because I, I want to change, and he did change. He changed dramatically. Not that he was just sorry for his sin. More than that, he took a 180 degree turn from corruption to change. Look at verse 14. Now after this, after this experience, what did he do? He built a wall without the city of David, on the outside of the city of David, on the west side of Gihon, in the valley, even to the entering end of the fish gate, and compassed about Ophel, and raised it up very great, very high, that's what he did, and he put captains of war in all the fenced city of Judah. In other words, 
I now care about Jerusalem. I'm going to protect it. I'm going to put me a wall out there so high I'm going to put guards out there. This is God's city. This is God's house. And you're going to have to come through me if you're going to destroy God's house. I protect God's house now. Continue on. Verse 15. He took away those strange gods. The idol out of the house of the Lord. The one that he put there. Took it out. Keep on going. And the altars that he had built in the mountain of the house of the Lord. That's Jerusalem there. And in Jerusalem, he cast them out of the city. I know I put them there when I was corrupt. And I know I did some bad things. But let me tell you, I'm changing. I'm, I'm going to take what God hates and I'm going to throw it outside the city because I now respect God. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to change. Verse 16, He repaired the altar of the Lord. He fixed it and sacrificed their own peace offerings and thank offerings. Come tonight at 6 o'clock. The title of the lesson during our worship hour is going to be offerings. So that's a teaching that you can be involved in. But continue on. He commanded Judah the, to serve the Lord God of it. I know that I caused y'all to serve false gods. Now, I'm king again. I command you to serve the God of heaven. I'm trying to get you back. I know I was so corrupt I hurt you, but I'm calling you back to God now. I'm trying to fix it. I'm changed. Now, if this was the rest end of the story, happy ever after, all's well. And it was with Manasseh. But folks, our sins have consequences. I believe that Manasseh will be in heaven when we get there. I'm not the judge. Only God's the judge. I believe Manasseh changed to the point that he just dedicated the rest of his life to God. But that corruption in his past life is certainly going to have a consequence that he can't help. Now, he could dwell on that. He could say, oh, if only I hadn't have done that. If only I could go back and change it. I do that all the time, and I shouldn't do that. But I can't change it. Be sure your sins will have the consequences of the seed that it plants. Look at verse number 17. Nevertheless, even though he changed, the people did sacrifice still in the high place. Yet, they did it to the Lord their God. Now that's good that at least on that hill out yonder they, they said, okay, this is for you God, but they were still sacrificing on those high places. Places that God didn't authorize to, to be worshipped. So, he stained the worship. It really was, it was okay that they worshipped God, but they just did it wrong. They, they didn't do it in the right place, at the right time, in the right way. He stained the worship. That's the consequences of his sin. He not only stained the worship for other folks, he stained his own legacy. You know, it's good that we have a legacy. Uh, you got a good name. A good name is more important than rubies, you know. But when you do something pretty bad, you can stain that legacy. Look at verse 18. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayer unto his God and the words of the seer that spake to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Behold, they are written in the books of the kings of Israel. Now, we don't have that book. We got First and Second Samuel. We got, we got the Chronicles, you know, First and Second Chronicles, uh, First and Second Kings. We got that history. But we really don't have the kings of Israel. We don't have that book. But here in this Chronicle, said you can read that book if you can get your hands on it. And in that book is the rest of his acts. It's, it's his legacy. It's what he did. And you can also read his prayer there. You know, he did pray. Remember when he was in affliction, he prayed to God? In verse 19, his prayer also. And how God entreated of him. He listened to him. All that's in there. And all his sins are in there too. His trespasses are in there. The places wherein he built those high places, that's recorded. He set up those groves and those graven images, that's recorded. 
before he was humbled. He did that all before he was humbled, before he changed. But it's still in the legacy. It's still in the book. They are written among the sayings of the seers. The good stuff and the bad stuff. There is a uh, set of writings called the Apocrypha. Young people, that's not part of the Bible. Now, there are some groups that if you open the King James Version and you look, you see some extra books in the Bible. And one of those books is the Prayer of Manasseh. It doesn't belong in the Bible. It's not authorized to be in our Bible. But it's out there. The literature's out there. And it's called the Prayer of Manasseh. I do not believe, young people listen to me, I do not believe that this is the inspired word of God, that this is the actual prayer of Manasseh. I do believe that 2 Chronicles is, and he told us that there's a prayer out there somewhere that he prayed. But this would be typical if you find that and read the prayer of Manasseh. I don't think this is necessarily his exact prayer, but this, the, what's in here would certainly uh, be something that he would have prayed where he humbled himself to God and he said, I, my sins are bad and, and I want to do better and I want to change. Well, that's exactly what he did. He changed. He did better. But even with this beautiful prayer, even with his change and trying to get things right, his legacy was still stained. And he stained his family. Look at verse number 20. So Manasseh slept with his fathers. That means he died. He was buried in his own house, and Ammon, his son, became the next king, reigned in his stead. Oh, good. We got a, he's changed. He's a good man now, and he tried to fix his corruption. Now I got my boy sitting on my throne. What's he going to do? Well, in verse number 21, he was 21 years old when he began to reign, Ammon was. He reigned for two years in Jerusalem, but... He did evil in the sight of the Lord, just like Manasseh, his daddy, did. That corruption stained his family. Ammon sacrificed unto all the carved images that Manasseh, his father, had made and served. Manasseh couldn't get it out of his boy. I did it. I, I wished I hadn't, but I've stained my son. And he did. So much so, verse number 23, he humbled, this is Ammon, humbled not himself before the Lord. Just like Manasseh, his father, had humbled himself. And Ammon trespassed more and more. He got worse. I'm not going to do that humbling myself thing. And his servants, this is how bad it happened. Ammon's servants conspired against him and slew him. That means he killed him in his own house. Bad things happened to Manasseh's son as a result of Manasseh's corruption. He can't go back and fix that. It is what it is. But there's hope. Look at verse 25. The people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Amnon. Bad things. And the people of the land then, after Amnon died, made Josiah his son king in his stead. Josiah is the grandson of Manasseh. Manasseh, then Ammon, and then Josiah. And if you read chapter 34 and following, Josiah was one of the best kings of Judah. A great king. He fell away at the end, but during the, it's like, he was a good king. So there's still hope for their future, as it were. But the consequences remain. In Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 4, Jeremiah did his prophecy several years after Manasseh. And here's what Jeremiah penned in his prophecy. God's talking to Jeremiah to tell the people something. What? Here it is. I will cause them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. I'm going to scatter these folks. Why, God? Why would you do such a thing? Because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah of Judah. What? Yes, for that which he did in Jerusalem. There are still consequences for our sins. Now, I think Manasseh changed. 
I think Manasseh just had a great end of his life and, and a wonderful relationship with God Almighty. I think that's wonderful. But folks, consequences are still there. And you can't fix all of them. So a lot of people will say, well, since Jerusalem is going to be destroyed because of my sins, since people are still going to be worshiping on the high places, since all this is happening because of me, then I'm not going to repent. What a foolish thing to do. Get yourself right. Because what if Manasseh had not changed? Then how bad would it have been if he continued to do pile up and pile up all those corrupt things in his life? There would have been no positive. Maybe Jos Josiah, his grandson, wouldn't have had any goodness. In I don't know. But here's the point. Don't dwell on because I'm a bad person and there's consequences of my deeds, therefore I'm not going to change. Don't do that. Learn from Manasseh. Change. Do the right thing. Don't agonize over those consequences. They're going to be there. They're going to hurt. It's, you can't change them. But don't agonize over them. Obey the plan of salvation today. And let God worry about the consequences. We can't. Too many times we are so worried about the consequences that we never take care of the process. Do the right thing today. God will take care of the consequences. And if we don't do the right thing today, the consequences are going to be horrible for us in eternity. But if you do what's right, right now, though all kinds of bad things happening around you and will happen as a result of your corruption in the past, at least there's a consequence that you can rest assured of. What? That heaven will be your home. Why don't you come while together we stand and sing?